Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here on this uh, kind of damp spring morning. A very sober note and serious statement I'd like to make before I begin to talk about our subject today. Spring break, lots of Lee students were lots of places doing lots of things, and I've enjoyed myself hearing from so many of you or your groups as you travel over spring break, either just going home or having fun or on a study trip or a, uh, a touring ensemble trip or an athletic trip. But at the end of spring break, we got the very sad news that we lost one of our students uh, unexpectedly over the spring break. The family asks, has asked us not to make a big deal out of this at this time uh, and to be low-key to give them a little privacy and a chance to absorb the loss of their daughter and sister, but um, did say it was okay for me to share the news with those of you who haven't heard it and to offer a prayer. Uh, we have a picture from uh, student ID, now you know how those are of Amelia Garrett. Amelia is a local girl who um, grew up here in Bradley County and graduated high school here. Actually went from there and served in the Air Force before coming and enrolling in Lee in our School of Nursing. Uh, she very popular, well-known, much loved by her colleagues in the School of Nursing, her faculty members, and her fellow students. So we have received the news of her death with a great deal of sadness and a great deal of appreciation for her life and a great deal of uh, care and concern for her family. So would you simply bow quietly and let me offer a prayer to express those things. Father, we do not understand your ways. Your ways are beyond our ways. But we know when the time comes to be grateful and when the time comes to be still. And this is such a time. First of all, we're grateful for the life of Amelia. We're grateful for all the good things that happened in her life. The many ways in which over the years you showed your, yourself to her. The fact that you loved her and she loved you. We thank you that she came to Lee and became part of our community here. Studied and lived and laughed on this campus. On behalf of all of her friends, her faculty members, to whom she was very important. We especially give you thanks. And our hearts go out this morning to her family to her brothers and sisters, to her parents, that you will hold them close and give them your peace and your love and your presence in this very, very difficult part of their journey. We thank you, Lord, for Amelia Garrett in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I'm very glad you're here today. I have been out of chapel a lot, but, you know, thanks to the magic of streaming video, I'm able to watch chapels even when I'm not here. Some of you probably know that it's not a particularly big deal. We haven't even mentioned it earlier than this. That every five years, one semester every five years, uh, I accept an appointment as a postdoctoral scholar at Harvard University and go up there and Darlie and I get a little apartment, and I become a part of the academy from a different perspective. Why do I do that? Because I want to keep learning. I don't want to ever stop learning. And I want to continue to develop my skills. Pretty good for me to be a student occasionally. And so instead of going to work in a suit and tie, I go to, I go to class in a sweater and a book bag. And But, you know, I'm still president and there's still work to be done down here so I can't just go up there and chill although one could certainly chill in Boston this time of year uh, but 
I'm, I'm, so I'm running back and forth. I'm spending three or four days up there and then a couple of days down here. And so if you see me around, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing this semester. But if you haven't seen me in chapel as much, then that, that's why. And actually, when I took a look, I haven't spoken in chapel in several weeks. And so I've looked forward to talking to you today. And thanks so much for being here. This is a wonderful crowd for this time of year. Now, I want to talk on the subject of hearing dead people talk, hearing dead people talk. And I want to start with a clip from a great movie. Now, you know I love movies. I think the last time I preached in chapel, I, I, I used a movie clip at the beginning of that Tom Hanks, you know, the box, box of chocolates, and at the end, we gave everybody a chocolate. Well, at the end of this movie, we give everybody nothing, actually, nothing. <laughs> It's about hearing dead people talk. Now, you, this movie's too old for you. It was bef long before you were born. But this is a terrific movie. So if you're really bored some night, you find this on Netflix. Some of you will have seen it. And many of you know Robin Williams, no longer living. But Robin Williams, great stand-up comic, but also a great actor. And he did a movie about 30 years ago, which was a huge hit, especially with college students. Because it was a story of a new teacher who goes to a prep school up in New England. He's the new guy. You remember this? Many of you will remember this. Dead Poet Society. Yeah, all right. Now, this new teacher, this guy, Robin Williams, they called him Mr. Keating in the film. He was kind of iconoclastic. He, you know, he raged against the machine. He was... You know, he kind of was crosswise with the administration all the time, something I definitely do not recommend, but uh, uh, worked for Robin Williams in this film. His name is Mr. Keating. Okay. The scene I'm going to show you, it's short. It's about three minutes, but you have to listen closely. There's no car chase here. You know, this is not for middle schoolers. You've got to listen and think. It's when Mr. Keating goes into class the first day. And instead of standing up in front of the class and teaching them, he says, come with me, boys, lads, he calls them. Come with me. And he takes them out in the lobby of this building where there's all these framed pictures of old dead people from this prep school. And that's where he begins to talk to them. Okay, let's watch this clip. It's Page 542, read the first stanza of the poem you find there. <coughs> the versions to make much of time? Yes. That's the one. <laughs> Somewhat appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a fly, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Thank you, Mr. Pitts. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. The Latin term for that sentiment is carpe diem. Now, who knows what that means? Carpe diem. That sees the day. Very good, Mr. Meeks. Meeks. Another unusual name. Seize the day. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Why does the writer use these lines? Because he's in a hurry. No. Ding! Thank you for playing anyway. Because we are food for worms, lads. Because believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room is one day going to stop breathing, turn cold, and die. And I'd like you to step forward over here and peruse some of the faces from the past. You've walked past them many times, but I don't think you've really looked at them. They're not that different from you, are they? Same haircuts, full of hormones, just like you. Invincible, just like you feel. The world is their oyster. They believe they're destined for great things, just like many of you. Their eyes are full of hope, just like you. Did they wait until it was too late to make from their lives even one iota of what they were capable? Because you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. 
If you listen real close, you can hear them whisper their legacy to you. Go on, lean in. Listen. You hear it? Now, on the one hand, that sounds pretty cold and brutal, doesn't it? He says, these lads are now food for worms. All of them, just like you, are going to get cold, die, and start fertilizing daffodils. But doesn't the Bible talk about life just that plainly? Many, many times it says, you know, hey, hey guys, all you full of life and energy and love and excitement and dreams. Just remember this, your life is like a vapor. It just, it's there and then it vanishes. It's like kind of a shuttle, it's here and it's gone. Another place uses actually similar metaphor to the one in the Robin Williams film, which it says, it's like a flower. It grows in all of its beauty and its glory and then the flower dies and it's a weed. Well, that's a pretty heavy idea and a pretty heavy thought. What I want to do is talk about this whole idea that Robin Williams makes so graphically at the beginning of this movie, Carpe Diem. Let's go back to that poem at the first part of this clip first. It's a poem from a British poet named Robert Herrick from the 1600s. So it has that old-fashioned feeling, but it actually sounds kind of biblical, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. 16th century British poet saying something very much like the Old Testament prophets, or for that matter, Jesus Christ himself, which is, it is exactly at times like now, when you're full of life, and the future seems endless, that it is a good idea to stop and say, you know, time just keeps flying, so gather rosebuds or knowledge or experience or friendships while you may, because these flowers that are so pretty today, tomorrow will be dying. This idea that's used in the, in the clip that was really popularized by that movie. And so you see this phrase, carpe diem, on sweatshirts and bumper stickers and all kinds of things. It's kind of become a part of the vocabulary of popular youth culture as a result of this film 30 years ago. Uh, The Robin Williams film kind of reintroduced this phrase, carpe diem. So you've probably heard it all your life growing up. But the phrase itself goes back 2,000 years to an ancient Roman writer, a pagan writer, from before the time of Christ, who expressed this idea that there's something about today that is not renewable. So seize it right now. You You can't bottle today. You can't can today. You can't store today. All you can do is seize today. Now, there's even more credible source than a British poet or a Latin scribe who talks about the same subject as the Bible itself, in which the Holy Spirit inspires the Apostle Paul. He wrote to his friends in a city called Ephesus, And therefore, to us here today in 2018, these words, redeem the time, for the days are evil. 
Carpe diem, in a sense. Seize the time, redeem the time, for the days are evil. Now, all these sources in different cultures and different cities talking to different audiences are talking about the most universal subject in human history, one of them, and that's the subject of time. Now, there's this kind of paradox about time. On the one hand, time is something that's absolutely common, and on the other hand, something about it that's absolutely profound. In a certain sense, time is totally ordinary. Men and women of all types in all ages talk about time, and we talk about it. Listen to the way we talk about time. We talk about it as if it were a commodity, like water, beans, air. So we talk about saving time, or we talk about spending time. When we're bored, we might describe ourselves as killing time. Or if we're up against some kind of deadline, we often worry that we're running out of time. Or if we're not particularly efficient or somebody else is not particularly efficient, we might say we or they are wasting time. But in all of these usages of ways of talking about time, it's as if it were a commodity that could be measured or counted and it could be stored up. It could be put in a can or a bottle. And of course, we know that we can't do that. Everybody has some of it, and everybody gets a new chunk of it every day. <coughs> but here's the thing about time. Nobody has any more of it than you do. Yeah, I know you're a lowly college student. You're living from paycheck to paycheck. A lot of people in the world have more money than you do. Lots of people have more power than you do. There are people out there who have more talents than you do, who have more stuff than you do, who have more connections than you do, but nobody has more time than you do. So on the one hand, it's very common. On the other hand, it's incredibly precious. Time is more valuable than anything else in the world. As a matter of fact, if you have time, you can always make money but no amount of money can buy even one second of time. And although in a sense, one time is the same as any other, actually there are certain occasions when time works more powerfully for us than it does on other occasions. And that's what this clip is all about. The Robin Williams character, Mr. Keating, is trying to tell his boys at Weldon Prep School that the most important thing they can possibly learn in life is how to value time, how to use time, how to seize time. And of course, he sums it up with the Latin phrase, carpe diem. You know, when I first saw that, it reminded me of my high school English class. It reminded me of Shakespeare. Now, I don't know much about Shakespeare, but there's one line from Shakespeare that most of us read and learned in high school English or college English. It's a great line, and it says just that. In Shakespeare, in the play Julius Caesar, there is a tide. Listen carefully to this. There is a tide in the affairs of men, and today we would say, and women, there's a tide which, if taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. In other words, there are moments in time which, if you act then, it leads on to success. This describes a moment of decision in Roman military and political history in which everything was lined up and for someone to act right then instead of waiting would make all the difference in victory or defeat. All the difference in success or failure. Shakespeare is saying through this character, it's not how many soldiers you have, it's not how big your army is, it's acting at the right moment in time that makes the critical difference. And we see this in sports all the time, don't we? For those of you who follow March Madness, been watching basketball the last couple of days, the last few days, consider University of Virginia, the number one seed in the nation, getting beat by University of Maryland, Baltimore County, the number 64 seed in a 64-team draw. The top team in the tournament, D1 
didn't just lose to the bottom team in the tournament. They get their socks blown off by the bottom team in the tournament, thereby humiliating briefly everyone from the state of Virginia or from the Atlantic Coast Conference. <coughs> now, nobody thinks UMBC can beat the University of Virginia basketball team every time out. Nobody thinks they're a better team. But as one boy said, he said, well, you know, obviously Virginia would have beat them nine times out of ten. But the answer was, yeah, but they, we don't have to play them ten times. We just have to play them once. All you got to do is bring your A game at the right time. I watched another team in the, in the, in the NCAA that missed, what, their last 13 or 14 shots from the field and lost to an underdog. And here's boys that have that are playing at the top level of college basketball and have been playing all ever since they were little tykes and they've been shooting these shots and making them and they can make them six times out of ten, seven times out of ten, eight times out of ten, but that none of that matters. The question is, can you make the shot now? <laughs> There's a moment in time at which to act now leads on to fortune, as Shakespeare says. You know, we had some great women's soccer teams here a few years ago that you've probably heard about. If you ever go into Paul Dana Walker Arena, you'll see these four national championship banners. There's well, something about those four teams. They were good all year long, but, you know, the important thing in sports is to sort of peak at the right time, to bring your game at the right time. There's something about those teams that when it mattered, they could focus and say, okay, now. That's what makes great champions. So what it tells us is that, you know, all time is not the same, that it's not just a matter of doing the right thing, it's doing the right thing at the right time. And we have phrases that express this in our popular vocabulary, little sayings we say, make hay while the sun shines, or strike while the iron is hot. I don't know how many of these of you have heard. Some of these probably go back, back to my grandma. A stitch in time saves nine. Or we talk about being in the right place at the right time. More contemporarily, some of you read the works of Malcolm Gladwell, a pop sociologist who writes these wonderful books about how life really works. And he has one book called The Tipping Point, in which he talks about this whole thing of critical mass, that is, things converging at the right time. And, and there's a tipping point at which a little more effort at the right time creates huge success. So when Robin Williams tells his prep school lads to lean in and listen to the people in those old photographs, he says, if those dead people could talk, they would all say the same thing. They would say, carpe diem, seize the day, seize this day, right now, while you have the opportunity. Now's the time to act, and if you do, things will fall into place for you which you can't imagine. The Apostle Paul said this a somewhat different way, and he said it with the power of the Holy Spirit. He tells us to redeem the time. Now, what does that mean to redeem the time? Well, to redeem something is to exchange it for a thing of value. So he's saying, take this common thing, this thing you have lots of, time, and redeem it, exchange it for something of great value. You know, you redeem a coupon to get something for it. Uh, I, I, my, on my Starbucks app, you buy, I have a Starbucks app, and every time you buy an overpriced coffee, you get stars, right? And when they all add up, then you can go show it to the, show it to the barista or the person at the counter, and, and you can redeem your stars for, a, for free coffee. I did it this morning. Redeem is to exchange something for something of value. And the Apostle Paul is saying, take this stuff that you're surrounded by that you seem to have so much of right now, but while you have it, redeem it. Put it to work. Exchange it for something of value. Invest it in something eternal. And he says, I'm challenging you to do this because the days 
in which you live are dangerous and you can easily become victims. That's what he means when he says the days are evil. What he means by the days being evil is no matter how good God is, or no matter how much you're how great your potential in the kingdom of God. These are evil days, and you could easily fail to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish, easily fail to grasp what's out there for you, easily fail to exchange your hours, your days for something great if you fail to redeem the time. And then, of course, Robin Williams leans in at that very last line that we showed and says, make your lives extraordinary. Redeem the time in a way to make your lives extraordinary. So let me offer a couple of specific suggestions. Three, really. One, don't worry about what happened in the past. In fact, let me say, if I were going to have a show of hands and say, how many of you identify yourselves as a procrastinator? Well, no, 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 please, 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 please don't embarrass yourself. As a matter of fact, I think if I had time, I would do this. I'd let you get your cell phones out and rate yourself on the procrastination scale from 1 to 10. But I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll do it later. Uh, don't really have, I'll talk about procrastination at some other time, but uh, <laughs> let me say to all you, how many, well, let me say, I know what I'm saying. Some of you not only know you're a procrastinator, procrastination is the primary motif of your life. Some of you know you are world-class procrastinators. Well, I have a message for you today. My message is this, forget about it. Quit beating yourself up about it. Quit thinking about being a procrastinator that's something that's in you, of you, through you, irredeemably you. No, no, don't worry about the things you didn't do yesterday or the things you didn't do last week or the things you didn't do last semester. Forget about it. Carpe diem. Start now. You got a big reset button up there in your life. Push the button. There's a saying I love that says, when is the best time to plant a tree? A hundred years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Right now. So you didn't plant the tree a hundred years ago. You didn't read the text last month. You didn't write the paper that's due next week, last week. You didn't do that stuff. You didn't take advantage of the opportunities. You procrastinated. You messed around. You're covered in shame and self-loathing. Okay, get over it. Draw a big red line down your life and say, start now. Carpe diem. Forget about yesterday. If you can just seize today, you've got plenty of days left, plenty of hours left, especially in the school <clears throat> calendar. You know, this is the kind of time, this is the time of year that people sometimes start to say, well, you know, I've screwed around so long. I'm so far behind. I've missed so many classes. My teacher already thinks I'm a loser, all that sort of thing. i have already, you know, whether it's socially or academically or spiritually, I've pretty well blown this semester, so I'm just going to kind of cruise on into the end, maybe get a grip this summer. That's absurd. Forget about what you didn't do. There's plenty of time for you to redeem this semester. There's plenty of time for you to make this a great semester in your life. If you were totally worthless from the middle of January till today, in the five or six weeks that are left, you can totally reverse this semester in your life. If you'll seize the day. Second thing I'd like to say. I'll try to say it without yelling so much. Why am I yelling? Why am I yelling? Why am I yelling? I don't know. Even I, it wears me out. I'm going to get me one of these bar stools and some skinny jeans and uh, (laughs) take my tie off, get me a cup of coffee and speak softly. 
I don't know when I'm going to start doing that later, you know. <laughs> Second bit of advice, don't be apologetic about wanting to do something big with your life. Could you hear in that film clip what Rob Williams said after Carpe Diem? He said, make your life extraordinary. And I want to tell you, you have everything you need to make your life extraordinary. God has put enormous ability inside you. Only he knows what you can achieve. You have the ability, the energy, and the hand of God on your life. And right now, you also have the time. Starting now, what you have to do is apply the time to the dream. Redeem the time. So don't apologize for wanting to change the world. Of course you can change the world. God knows it needs to be changed. But you can't change the world by living a frivolous life even when you're young and in college. College is it's a time for fun. It's a time for friendship. It's a time for unplanned pleasures. But alongside that, it's also a time to be preparing to make your life extraordinary. And remember that changing the world requires more than just passion. It requires preparation. Your college years are the time for that. Remember what I said about doing the right thing at the right time? Well, if you're really going to have an extraordinary life, you can't just rush out and have that life without first having the discipline to prepare. And so this is the time for preparation to change the world. So it's important that you not spend all your time frivolously, and it's also important that you not jump at every noble and admirable distraction. So if you want to end racism, are you willing to make the sacrifice to get yourself ready to really make a difference? Can you imagine how history would have been different if Martin Luther King Jr. in his sophomore year at Morehouse in Atlanta had rushed out and spent all his time protesting against the bigots in Fulton County? No, he didn't do that. Instead, he was willing to grind it out, first in college, then in graduate school, long years of preparation in which he never lost his passion. He never lost sight of his goal, but he never was distracted by the immediate so that he failed to prepare and then when the time was right, God did something extraordinary through his life. I had a student once who got so caught up protesting social injustice that he skipped classes, failed to do his work, and ironically missed some important lessons on the psychological mechanisms of social injustice. Because he was so distracted by the small immediate minor distractions they took up all his time and the question is is that how to seize the day is that how to make your life extraordinary i've had students who are so committed to spreading the gospel and who's not a favor of that we're so committed to preaching and witnessing and leading in worship that they ignored the classroom Spent all their time running out of here to preach and sing and lead in worship. Some of them dropped out of Lee. They were so eager to rush out the door and get soul saved. But then I've seen in the lives of others who were patient. They worked hard as students. They cared about souls and the gospel. They never lost their passion. And in God's timing for them, they made a huge difference in the kingdom. We talked about Billy Graham here lately from the death of Billy Graham, who once lived on this campus. Can you imagine how the religious history of the 20th century would have been different if Billy Graham had been so hot to go out and save souls that he didn't stay in school, he didn't use his time well, he didn't get ready for the great ministry God gave him? So when God challenges you to redeem the time, it means do now what you're supposed to be doing now while expecting God to use it in the future, in the future, in an extraordinary way. When it's time to plant, you plant. And when it's time to water that plant, you water. And then when God sees you're ready, he'll give you the time 
to reap. Third point, don't wait until you know exactly what you're doing to do something. My challenge to you today is this, do something today that will express the kind of person you want to be and the life you want to live. It doesn't have to be something big. In fact, it rarely is something big. The important thing is when you leave here today to start on it today, seize this day, not tomorrow. Redeem the time today. Redeem this time academically. Take the time to do those things. Go to that class. Go early. Go on time. If you have a paper do next week, do it this afternoon. Don't wait till the weekend. If there's any kind of extra credit, decide right now and start on it. If it's optional, take it. If there's something you don't understand, ask the teacher. Do something now. Carpe diem. In your relationships, if you've had an impulse to do something, to meet someone, to say something to somebody, do it now. Those positive feelings you've had about a teacher or an RD or a coach or a boss or your parents back home or your kid brother, do it now. Don't spend all semester saying, one of these days I'm going to send him a note. Do it now. Think about your family today, right now, right here. You'll be back home in a month or so. It'll be too late then to have the same impact that gesture can have now. And what about spiritually? Spiritually, God wants to move toward you, and he wants you to move toward him. It's the perfect time to make that move toward God now. Perfect time to make that commitment to thank him for all your gifts and use them for his glory. Okay, let's go to back to that scene to the, from the movie. Remember when Robin Williams asked the boys to lean in and listen to the dead people if they were alive to talk? Well, let's talk about a similar version of that right here, closer to home. We're in our centennial year. We're celebrating 100 years. We're seeing lots of photos of old dead people, and we're talking a lot about them. And if I may borrow from Robin Williams, let me remind you that these people, too, in our old leaf photos were once just like you, full of energy, full of youth, full of hormones, as he said, full of dreams. Now, look at these people, and let's listen to what they might have to say to you. That's somebody named Jesse Capshaw up on the left. She came when she was 14 years old, too young to come to Lee, talked her way in because she wanted to go back to North Carolina and help her dad, who was a widower, pastor his church. That was 100 years ago this year. She did something extraordinary with her life. Look at this person here. His name is Paul Haven Walker. He came all the way from North Dakota down to Tennessee, playing an old guitar, came to BTS to get ready to plant churches, went back out to North Dakota, South Dakota, Western Canada, planted dozens of churches all over that area. One of the churches he planted was the church in which my wife's parents came to the Lord. He was a young guy, full of energy in himself one time. He's been dead a long time now. What would he say to us today? Here's one photograph from 80 years ago, the class of 1939. I like this class, I like this photo so much I have it framed and hanging on the wall in my office. I'd be glad for you to come by and take a look at it sometime. We'll have a selfie, come anytime. Let's look at some people in this photograph. That was a guy named Ray Hughes, young, energetic, frequently in trouble, went on to become what many people regard one of the greatest evangelists in the history of the Pentecostal world and came to Lee as president twice. And if you live in New Hughes Hall, that's the guy, this, this, uh, this is the guy your dorm was named for, Edna Minor. Edna Minor, young girl in a river town in northern Alabama, got on a train Went to East Tennessee, changed to another train, changed to a bus to go to BTS to prepare herself for whatever God had for her. In the minor, wound up becoming a minister's wife and having 12 children, and she put all 12 of those children through Lee College. Roosevelt Miller, 
Roosevelt Miller, a guy with a beautiful tenor voice who came to Lee and led our music, or taught in our music department for many years, is generally considered as the person who created the Ladies of Lee, even though it was already here when he got here. Odeen Morse. Odeen Morse went to Haiti right out of college, served for decades, say, helping build churches and support the work of the church in Haiti. Charles Kahn. Charles Kahn never went to college, but one year, it was his one year at Lee, never took a history course, wound up writing a history of the denomination, the Church of God, that for 50 years later, people still regard as kind of a model of denominational history, and of course, came to Lee. We're in a building right now that was named to recognize his leadership. Or let's look at, there's five from that same picture. Or let's look at a couple of more recent ones. Margaret Gaines. Margaret Gaines, young, pretty, from Alabama, called to the mission field, went to Tunisia. Couldn't get to Church of God to give her an official appointment because they didn't like the idea of a young single woman going to off as a missionary. So she went on her own. She raised the money. She went on her own. She spent a lifetime in the Middle East, was deeply beloved by the people of the Middle East, recently passed away. Or much more recently, Don Altman. Look at that young guy. He could become right out of the Robin Williams film. Lots of talent, great musician, wonderful thinker, strong leader. That's Don Altman when he sat where you sat. Don Altman died yesterday. Actually, when I started putting these notes together, I would not have had his picture in it because he was still living. Thursday, if you see things coming and going from the chapel in the afternoon, it'll be his funeral because he wanted to have it here because he really loved Lee. He came to Lee, taught psychology, was the chief academic officer, made an enormous difference in the culture of this place and of his church. Now, if these old dead people could talk, or if I were Robin Williams and I'd say, lean in, boys and girls, what do you think they would say to you? Redeem the time. Your life can be extraordinary. Let's stand, please. In addition to the normal college benediction, I would like to add a prefix. Oh, dear God. God, please give us dry, warm weather in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now let's do the college benediction. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. God bless you. I love you.